I'd rather be right here than just about any place else. The only other place I could think of that would be better than this is heaven. How many people here know about the rapture? The catching away of the church, the blessed hope of the church, Titus said. And, you know, I keep thinking about that, and I think that in that fast, everything that we are familiar with, everything that we know and have experienced in this life is going to disappear instantly. And it won't matter. None of that stuff will matter. The things that we think are really important to us right now, the plans we're making, the stuff we have at home, uh, our toys, our vacations, all that stuff, it, it's all good while we're here, but in, in one flash of a moment of time, a trumpet is going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Those of us who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. You know what the Bible says? It says, the next verse says, comfort one another with these words. What does that mean? That means that on our daily uh, struggles and challenges and all that stuff, what should be our, our comfort? What should we be looking at? We should be looking at the coming of the Lord. Amen? Praise the Lord. Yeah, so anyway, we're going to open our Bible. That's, that doesn't have anything to do with my lesson this morning. It's just to let you know that I'm really glad that I'm here. Lamentations, chapter 3. And uh, I, I knew where I was heading a week ago. And then, I think it was Tuesday at prayer. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time looking at the, the screen, although there's verses cycling through. Uh, during our prayer times, uh, but I happened to catch one, and it was uh, Lamentations 3, 24. And I said, That's, that, that'll fit right where I'm going. So are you there? Page 1062, if you have a really cool Bible. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Lamentations 3, verse 24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Glory to God. Father, thank you this morning. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for so great a salvation. Lord, we thank you this morning for the blessed hope. God, that we have an eternal promise, a living hope, an inheritance Lord, that's waiting for us in heaven that can never fade away. But Father, make your word, I pray, alive and powerful this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord is my portion. I think we've, we've probably sung some songs about that over the years. And uh, it, it talks a lot about that in the book of Psalms. Portion, in this passage, refers to my allotment or my inheritance. And most of us, when you think about an inheritance, you think about the last will and testament. Now, one of my favorite movies was on last night. I didn't see it because I was doing other things. But it's Jeremiah Johnson, the Robert Redford movie. And he comes up on this guy that's frozen stiff. He's sitting against a tree. He's frozen. There's frost all over his face and his beard. And he's got his rifle in his hands. And... He's got a note pinned on his chest. So Jeremiah Johnson pulls that thing off, and it's his last will and testament. And he says, I, Hatchet Jack, being of sound mind and broke legs, bequeath this rifle to whatever finds me. <laughs> it killed the bear that killed me, and it is a good rifle. And so he ended up inheriting you know, he got his inheritance, a little portion of it there. So that, that will and testament, is it happens when a person of means passes. You know, when some of us pass away, nobody's going to be fighting over what we have because most of it, if you look around my house, there's not a lot there. I mean, there's some stuff, but most of the, if you go out in the barn area and stuff, it's just junk. 
I can't help it, I'm a hoarder. But a people of means, when they pass the survivors, uh, they start jockeying for position. They want to know who's going to get what. Well, I want this and I want that. And, and sometimes uh, w- when I have officiated at funerals or memorial services, you got family members that aren't even sitting together or talking to each other because they're angry over their allotment or their portion. Uh, fights even break out over people saying, I, I got to get my issue. Okay? Well, Jeremiah said here in the Lamentations, the Lord is my portion. He's my allotment. He's my inheritance. And when you read through the Old Testament, when you, when you get to the Abraham, and we're going to turn over there right now, Genesis uh, chapter 12. The pastor has taught on this. He so used these verses here quite a bit in the last uh, couple of months. <clears throat> but in the, in the Old Testament, there is... There's a dual blessing. There is the physical inheritance of, that's passed on from the, the patriarch when he dies. His, his physical kingdom, if you will, is dispersed according to a protocol. And then there's also a spiritual blessing. And that's the one that's important. Peter said, it's our, we're born again to a living hope, a lively hope, to an inheritance that's reserved for us in heaven that can't fade away. Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where nobody can steal it or moth isn't going to corrupt it and it's not going to get rusty. Well, why would you want to lay up treasures in heaven if you're not going to show up to collect? Right? Genesis chapter 12 Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. A separation is coming here. We're going to, I'm separating you. If you'll do this, if you'll be obedient to me, you're going to be separated from what you know, from what is familiar to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram, who becomes Abraham, a lot of times in the Bible you see people's names get changed. Abraham, Abram becomes Abraham. So we're just going to call him Abraham from now on. God separates him. Right now, uh, the earth is full of people. And after Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel, when God confounded the languages uh, and uh, divided the people up into races of people and language groups and ethnicities. And then he goes in among them and he finds Abram, Abraham, and he says, I'm singling you out from all these people and I'm going to make of you a great nation. And this is going to be God's people in the Old Testament. And he says, I'm going to give you a land. If you go to Genesis chapter 15... And verse 7, it says, then, then he said to him, that's the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. Verse 13, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And verse 16 But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And so God promises him the land. He takes him out. He shows him the land. And and Abraham begins operating under under the covering of a promise, the mantle of a promise. And that promise begins to be renewed generation by generation. In Genesis 26, and we don't have to turn to all these, but in Genesis 26, uh, God renews that Isaac is the son of promise, as Abraham's son. And God appears to him and speaks to him and renews this promise that I'm giving you and your descendants this land. Then he meets up with Jacob. This this one's worth reading. uh, Genesis 28. 
We'll probably visit this one a couple of times before we get done this morning. <clears throat> Genesis 28, uh, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and he went toward Haran. Uh, he came to a certain place and night fall came. He got a rock and put it at his head. I assume for a pillow. He was tougher than me. Verse 12, he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to the heaven. This is, if you've ever heard stories or songs about Jacob's ladder, this is it. Okay? And there were angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. So the promise is renewed generation by generation. Uh, in Genesis chapter 50, when uh, Joseph has been sold into Egypt in, in, in the chapter 42, I think, and he's down there and God elevates him to a place of leadership and the famine happens where his brothers and his father Jacob live and they... Uh, end up coming down to Egypt to get grain and to escape the famine. Joseph takes care of them, and God speaks to him at the end of his time, and he says, uh, I'm not going to leave you here, but your bones are going to go back to the land that I promised the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, by the way. And then in Exodus chapter 3, after this 400 years of uh, uh, affliction have happened in Egypt. God appears to Moses. Hi, Sandy Prather. So good to see you walking under your own power. Praise the Lord. So Moses, at, at 400 years of this affliction, God appears to him in the burning bush, and he says, I'm calling on you to lead these people out of Egypt and get them to the land that I have promised them. He's renewing the promise. He's pointing them again to the promised land. In Numbers chapter 27, uh, 12 to 23, Joshua uh, becomes Moses' successor. God, uh, Moses says, hey, God, I know I'm gonna, not going to get into the promised land, so uh, we need a successor here. And so uh, God tells him to take Joshua set him in front of the people, lay hands on him, put some of his honor or authority on him in front of the people so they know this is the new leader. And God says that Joshua is going to lead them to their promised land. So each generation is pursuing their inheritance and they're under the mantle of this promise. I know this is getting laborious, but I'm really going somewhere this morning. And the story from Abraham all the way to, to Joshua getting the people into the promised land is mostly a story about these people pursuing their promise, about going after their inheritance. They're, they're going places. God told Abraham, get up and get going. You're not, don't, don't sit here. Get up and get going. And then these people have been on the move for a long time. And that's the story, but... Along the way, their landscape is, is littered with the carnage of people who got distracted, who started loving the world, who started getting a complaining attitude, uh, or just got weary and tired and sat down. And all those people were left by the wayside and were not the, the only a remnant went in to the promised land. Some of those people, so I got wrote in your note here, some of those people just... We're just happy with the way things were. They got out there in the, into the wilderness. They experienced a little bit of difficulty. And some of them even began to say, hey, you know what? Being a slave in Egypt was better than this. Whoa. Back in Egypt, at least we got our meals. We got, they got out there. They, got, they complained there's no water. So God gave them water. They got out there and they said... There's no food. So God, every morning, has given them manna on the ground. After a while, they said, we don't like the manna. So God gave them quail, enough that they choked to death on it. <laughs> Some people just aren't going to be happy. But 
the remnant were busy, and that's the, when you follow the story, it's about the remnant that were pursuing their inheritance. They wanted to obtain their portion. And so on page two, uh, it says, we have arrived. Isn't that nice? We've arrived. Everybody have, you ever feel like you've arrived? You know, I always feel like when we go camping and we roll into the campground and I look on, in my mirror and the camp, camper is still hooked on the back of the truck, we have arrived. Here we are. You know, and usually where we go camping involves climbing the mountain, whether we're going to Caribou or whether we're going to uh, Snowflower or wherever we just went. Uh, it usually involves climbing the mountain, pulling a trailer, and so that's always like stress. You know? And when you, when you arrive, you look in the mirror and you go, it's, everything's still there. We've arrived. And then when we leave after you're there a few days and you leave to come home, boy, when I back that thing in the driveway, I go... We have arrived. But you know, when you arrive, that's no time to just let your guard down and, and go shift into neutral. When these people arrived into their promised land, God gave them some instructions because this promised land was occupied. It was occupied by a whole bunch of ites. Not mites, but ites. The Jebusites, the Parasites, the Hittites, I don't know, a whole bunch of ites. All these people groups are in this land, and God says, I want you to drive them out. I'm going to drive them out before you. If you just walk with me, I'm going to drive these guys out. You're going to, you're going to be the instrument that's going to make it happen, and you're going to subdue the land. The first thing he said in Deuteronomy 12, just before they get into the promised land, God says, first thing you do as you find the place where I put my name. I'm going to put my name someplace. And wherever that is, that's where you're going to worship. That's where you're going to bring your tithe. That's, where, that's, that's going to be the hub of life, wherever I put my name. Oh, in 1978, excuse me, 1975, I went into the latrine at Beale Air Force Base, and I, I was running amok. I had, I had drugs in my system. I had a beer in my hand. I had murder in my heart. I was messed up. And God came in there and slapped the devil, and I fell out of his shirt pocket. And God said, I'll take that guy right there. And the first Christian that I met brought me to this church. He put his name here for me. I have looked for the exit sign to flash a couple of times. I even hoped it would a few times over the years, but it never did. And I'm not going to go beyond the parameters that God set for me. He said, this is where I want you. Okay? Find your place of worship. Then he said, drive out the inhabitants. Destroy their idols. Get rid of all that stuff. The reason that God is giving them this land and requiring them to drive the inhabitants out is because when you go back to Genesis 15, he says the, the iniquities, the cup of sin of the Amorites is not yet full. It's not quite time for my judgment to fall on them, but now it is. 400 years later, it's time. And so when you go in there, he says, you got to kill everybody. <gasps> God. God. God is love, right? Ask anybody. God is love. God is love. Why would you require these people to go in there and kill everybody? If, you, if you're familiar with the book of Joshua, the, they sent some spies. They sent a couple spies over into Jericho, which was the first city that they were going to attack. And the spies ended up at the prostitute's house, a house of ill repute. Why would they go there? Because everybody was going there, and they wanted to blend in. They were spies. They wanted to look like everybody else, so they end up going there. Rahab the harlot. Okay? Well, why was everybody going there? Because in this country at this time, they, they had two major sins that were requiring God to judge them harshly. They worshiped sex 
and they killed their babies. I don't know, if you look around the world, there, there may be a country not too far from here that fits that demographic. Okay? So it finally got full. And God says, you're going to go in there, destroy their idols, drive the people out. And in Leviticus 18, he said, when you get it, he listed a whole bunch of things. And he says, don't do what they did or you're going to get what they got. Okay? And so the people's response was, they got in there, they didn't drive out all the inhabitants. You look in the book of Judges, the first couple chapters, and it says, these guys didn't drive out those guys. These, this tribe didn't drive out these guys. And it lists about six or seven of the tribes of Israel that did not drive the people out of their inheritance land. God said, don't make any treaties with them, and they made treaties with them right off the bat. They polluted themselves with the traditions of the Canaanites. I didn't understand what making your kids pass through the fire meant for several years after I was saved. I always thought when I read the book of Kings and Chronicles and it, and it talked about they, they made their kids pass through the fire, I thought they like took their little babies and waved them over a candle in some ceremony or something. No, they had a, they had a statue to a god named Dagon and he was, I don't know how big he was, but it was a hollow statue of a, a human-looking thing, and he had his arms like this, and he had a hole in his chest, and in the back there was a hole. They built a fire in there, and when these babies that were a product of their gross sexual immorality were born, those babies cramped their style from their worship. So what did they do? They offered them to Dagon. They put them on the arms and rolled them down through the hole and just burned them up in the fire. That's like full-term abortion, okay? I don't, I don't have time to go down that trail. But anyway, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we got to get there. I'm, I'm trying to get, get where I'm going this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 8. They get into the land, and they've been operating on... The system of thus saith the Lord. God spoke to Abraham, spoke to Isaac, spoke to Jacob, spoke to Joseph, spoke to Moses. These were all leaders of God's people who heard from God and said, this is what God says, this is what we're going to do. And everybody, most everybody would say, yep, that's what we're going to do. And they would follow, thus saith the Lord. They get in there, then they get Judges, the book of Judges after Joshua and then uh, all those judges, Samuel was the last judge of Israel. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Uh, verse 3, his sons did not walk in his ways. Verse 4, then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, look, you're old, your sons do not walk in your ways now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. This is probably one of my hobby horses. If you've ever heard very many sermons of mine, you have this underlined in your Bible. Okay? They came, God's people, the leaders of Israel, came to Samuel, the man of God, and said, we don't like this system of thus saith the Lord. Because Samuel said, hey God, these guys don't like me anymore. They don't want to follow me. And God said to him, hey, you're not that important. It's not you they don't like. It's me. It's me they don't like. It's thus saith the Lord. This is how you're going to live and do it that they don't like. So they want to be like everybody else. And so when God's people decide that we want to start being like the world and be like everybody else, it's the beginning of the end. This was the beginning of the end of Israel in their promised land. And from there to the book of Malachi, to the end of the Old Testament, all those prophets were the voice of God trying to straighten that mess out, and they never got it straightened out. And the people kept doing what the inhabitants of the land had been doing, and God allowed them to be driven out of their land and go into captivity. And nobody heard hardly anything out of them until 1948. <laughs> In 1948, Israel, uh, they actually went on a terrorism campaign. Um, Menachem Begin was a terrorist. He was like the first prime minister of Israel. 
or second one or whatever, he ended up, when they were trying to get their land back, he ended up bombing the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. So they, they, they went out on a, on a blood rampage to get their land back, but for all those generations, nobody ever heard anything out of them. Why? Because God's people started being like everybody else. God doesn't want us to be like everybody else. He wants us to be different. Okay? So now in the New Testament, I know that's a long way around the barn to get in here, but our portion as born-again New Testament believers is an inheritance in heaven. It's the reality of God in us. In the Old Testament, people were not not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Their external, their religion was external. God imposed ten commandments as a pressure on people to try to get them to do right with a threat of death if they didn't follow those ten commandments. Okay? In the New Testament, we are born again. John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and he says, what do I need to do to get to heaven, to inherit eternal life? What, what are you all about? And Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And later in the he, verse or two later, he says, unless you're born again, you can't see. Being born again, you can see the kingdom and you can enter the kingdom. But you have to be born again. You have to be born of the Spirit. It's a heavenly inheritance and it's a heavenly promise the Jewish people were looking for their worldly inheritance. There is a flavor of Christianity. This is why you've got to be careful who you submit yourself to and who you listen to uh, concerning spiritual things. There is a large segment flavor of Christianity that have departed from the traditional gospel and hope of the church and embrace the idea that the church is we are, is, we are spiritual Israel, and we are setting up a kingdom right here on this planet. It's called dominion theology. Don't even waste your time going to look it up. Just listen to whatever you hear coming out of this pulpit and our pastor right here. Okay? Amen? Amen. Amen. How about... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, First Peter, he says, we're born again to a living hope of inheritance. It's reserved in heaven for us. Our, our inheritance is reserved in heaven. It's not here. There's a lot of people running around trying to get their earthly inheritance as Christians. Well, I've got, look at all the promises. Hey, the promises that Jesus gave us is, you shall have tribulation. <laughs> but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Okay? Paul said... Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, and that causes me a lot of problems because I have that message. So we're not looking for an earthly inheritance. Okay? He gives us so great a salvation, the Bible calls it, and then he gives us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 7, verse 37 On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And remember in John chapter 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well, and he said, If I give you water to drink, the, the, the water that I have, you will never thirst again. He's not talking about your physical body. He's talking about... Something happening on the inside of you that revolutionizes how you see everything. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record John the Baptist saying that when Jesus shows up, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And Jesus shows up, lives his life, puts three years or so of ministry out, and dies on a cross 
and never baptizes anybody in the Holy Spirit. But Sunday's coming. Somebody had a song years ago, probably back in the 80s. It may be Friday, but Sunday's coming. Friday looked like a bad day, which was actually Thursday. But anyway, when Jesus died on the cross, darkness fell. The hopes of the people who followed him were crushed. But that's not the end of the story. On Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. He, he took power over death, hell, and the grave. And then he, he led the people out of Jerusalem after about 40 days. And he, he said, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days when the, from now. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to have power to be witnesses to me. And then when you get into Acts chapter 2, he says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were all 120 people in one place with one accord, and suddenly, I'll tell you, I've, I've, I've had a few suddenlies in my life. God suddenlies. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven, and it filled the whole room where they were at. And they looked around, there was tongues of fire sitting on everybody's head. And then they all began to speak in an unknown tongue. When the Spirit gave them the utterance, they're speaking in tongues, 120 people, all of them. And when the crowd came around and said, what in the world's going on here? Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, God said, I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh. If we were in the last days 2,000 years ago, we're, we may be in the last day now. I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Young men are going to see visions. Old men are going to dream dreams. Coach has been telling us about his dreams lately. Where is he? There he is. <laughs> What does that say about us, coach? <laughs> okay. And in Acts 2, 29, at the end of Peter's discourse, he said this promise, this promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this promise is to you and it's to your children, that's the next generation, to as many as are afar off, that generation after generation, the promise is renewed to every generation. As many as the Lord our God shall call. If God has called you remotely, his plan is for you to seek his face and be baptized in the Holy Spirit and have this power of prayer language in your life, that, this revolutionizing experience. This transcends us from Sunday religion to an everyday captivated by the Holy Ghost. To an everyday of Christ is our life. That's going to, at the end of my notes here where i got to get to. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And when that happens, I'm telling you, a separation comes. A separation comes. God said to Abraham, get up and separate yourself from everything you've known, your family, your life, your relatives, and follow me. A separation comes. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26, God said, I have... I have her. <laughs> too, many, too many fingers going at the same time. I have severed you from other people that you should be mine. God, when you get born again, you, you've been cut out from the crowd, folks. You, you, it's like pulling your finger out of the bowl of water. The hole is gone. You can't find it. There's no place to stick it back in. He severs us from other people that we should be his. In 2 Corinthians, in the New Testament, chapter 6, he says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. I want you for myself. I don't want to share you with the world. 1 John 2, 15, don't love the world or the things that are in the world. So that, all that was my introduction. So here's, here's the message I want you to have today. We are under, at this church, on this street corner, in this auditorium, we are under the mantle of promises. Just like those Old Testament uh, Israelites, they were under an umbrella, if you will, an umbrella of a promise. And wherever that umbrella went is where they had to go to stay under the promise. And it would lead them to their promised land. The promises that we are under 
One of them is Zechariah 4.6, where Zechariah was trying to rebuild the temple. He was meeting some challenges and problems and opposition, and the word of the Lord came to him. Excuse me, Zerubbabel was, was the guy building. Zechariah was the prophet who came to him and said, hey, I know what you're up against. God knows what you're up against, but it's not by might or by power. It's not your own effort and your own working. It's not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Yeah, it's by his spirit. That became the battle cry of the Pentecostal people of the early 1900s. In the early 1900s, God poured out renewing the baptism of the Holy Spirit around the world. And a major hub of that was on Azusa Street in Los Angeles. And there was a three-year-long revival where the, the, the place was open literally 24 hours a day. And people were being saved, they were being healed, they were being baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were, the, the prophetic words were coming. And Jesus said, when you receive that Holy Spirit, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're going to be a witness. In other words, there's going to be a compelling force inside of you that's going to drive you into the harvest field. And so these people began to gather together. And in, in uh, 1914, I think it was, 300 of these Pentecostal people or so gathered in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and they said, how are we going to get the gospel? we got to get this to the world. Everybody's got to know. Say what, when Jesus delivered me from the power of darkness in the latrine at Beale Air Force Base, the first Christians I met, I went into a barracks room, and those guys are sitting over there, and they're looking at me, and I'm telling I don't even know anything. I don't know Jesus died on a cross. I don't know David killed Goliath. I don't know Daniel was in the lion's den. I'd never been to Sunday school or church. I didn't know anything. And I just kept telling those guys, you know, don't you? You know. And they're like, yeah. I said, you know what I know. Only thing I know is that God touched me and he's real. <laughs> he's real. A power from outside this world that I don't know anything about touched me and made me different. In an instant, I was delivered from the power of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God. I said, you know, you know what I know, don't you? And they said, yeah, we know. And I said, well, we gotta go tell everybody. Let's get up and get going. Everybody has to know this, okay? That was, that was what was burning in the hearts of these fledgling Pentecostal church and they began to say, it's not by might. Somebody got a hold of that promise. It's not by might or by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's how it's going to happen. If it doesn't happen like that, it isn't going to happen. Anything that happens outside of that isn't probably worth much. Okay? Zechariah 10, 1 and 2 was God's promise to my pastor, pastorhood. Now, I only have a couple of minutes here. I've got to tell you something that... Most of you do not know how unusual this place is. It, does, it might not seem unusual to you one bit because you come in here every Sunday and you hear and the word and we worship and we have a good time. We fellowship a little bit. And we roll out and so on. And, and we just enjoy being here and being around other believers. But most of us don't are not aware of how unusual what you're sitting in really is. Zechariah 10, 1 and 2 was a promise that God gave my pastor. And it says, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord will make bright clouds and showers of rain and grass in the field for everyone. Because the idols have spoken vanity, the diviners have seen a lie. They tell false dreams, they comfort in vain, and therefore the people are scattered with no shepherd. And God said, ask me for the rain. Ask me for that outpouring of the Spirit. Ask me for it. And Pastor began to ask him for it. And Pastor Hood, when he got saved, he was from a Baptist background and he wasn't Pentecostal. But he went to a Pentecostal Bible college. And one night, and he'd been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was like praying, God, fill me. God, fill me. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And he, I don't know how long he'd been praying that, but one Thursday night after the chapel service at, at the Bible college he was at, 
they had a prayer meeting. And he prayed and prayed and prayed. He said he prayed until he was soaking wet with sweat. Rolling on the floor. He was laying under, on his back under the piano in the chapel. And at the stroke of midnight, he said a light came from somewhere and shot out. And he said it hit me right in the forehead and I started speaking in tongues. Wow. And in 1969, January of 1969, Pastor Hood and his wife and two small daughters landed here, in, not here next door in the old church. And Pastor said one day he was praying about our church, and God told him that he was going to do something special in our church. And he did. And what he did was he showed up with his presence, a captivating presence. And, and I know there's, uh, I don't know, probably 150 people in here. I don't know how many people are here right now. But over the course of years, I've been here 48 years. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that I have seen thousands of people transformed at these altars. I've seen thousands of people sitting under the presence of the Holy Spirit and have their life completely revolutionized, captivated. Once he touches you and you become enlightened, really enlightened that God is really real. This is not a religion thing that we just do on Sundays, but God's really real and he's going he's, he's to be talking to you when you walk out these doors tomorrow morning when you wake up, he's right there. Then you start living your life out of that. Well, the unusual part about that is that God has perpetuated that through generations. Our church has a heritage. Pastor's getting ready to do something about a heritage wall. And, and it's our heritage, not just our history, but our heritage. And most churches, when the pastor's done, either the people decide he's done, or he decides he's done, or God decides he's done, but when a pastor is done, he usually leaves town, and an, another Pastor is interviewed from resumes and whatever, and a, a total stranger shows up and becomes the leader of the congregation. And that brings an entirely new dynamic. It brings, it's out with the old flavor and in with the new flavor. And you're always going to lose some people when that happens. It's just because that's not what we're used to and whatever. Um, but what happens here was... God gave Pastor and Sister Hood a, a, a revival. God poured out his Holy Spirit, and we learned how to know him in the Spirit, not just in my head. And we're still under that mantle because Pastor Hood turned over the reins in 1997 to Pastor Baker. Dave and I, Baker and I were on staff together. And then after three years, Pastor Baker left, and I had never had any aspirations or idea that I would ever lead this church. But on January 3rd, 2000, I walked to this pulpit because Pastor Dave said, hey, I'm not going to be there Sunday. Can you preach for me? I had no idea that he was on his way looking somewhere else. I came to that pulpit. I put my Bible and notebook down there, and I heard... God say, this is your pulpit. And I'm, th I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I refuse to usurp authority. I know what that looks like, and I'm not doing it. I'm arguing with God in my head while I'm trying to get ready to deliver a message. And when I opened my Bible and read my text, I don't see, I don't see things in the Spirit hardly ever. But when I read my text, I don't even know what I preached on that day, but I saw something come down out of that ceiling and it landed on me. And it was, I knew, it was Pastor Hood's anointing. It was his mantle. He, was, he lived in Roseville. He wasn't even here. And his mantle landed on me. Well, back in 1985 when I was at my ordination ceremony in Sacramento, 
Pastor Hood's symbolically, ceremonially placed his mantle on my shoulders in that ceremony. And God did it a few years later. And we become keepers of the spring. I know I'm running along here, but we've got to go to Genesis 28. And I'm, I promise I'll get done right here. Genesis 28. Back to Jacob and Jacob's ladder. He saw, in his dream, he saw a ladder going up to heaven. There was a, a portal, if you will. There was a hole there, and this ladder went up into heaven. And God was up there. And his angels were ascending and descending. The spiritual traffic was taking place. And when I became pastor here in 2000, I begged Pastor Hood to come back and speak for us. And he was reluctant. He didn't even want to do it. But finally he did. And this is where, what he brought us. He brought us this, the idea that Jacob woke up in the morning after having this experience. Yeah, let's see. In verse 16, Jacob woke from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. God had opened a gate there, and pastor began to tell us that God had opened a gate in this place right here. He got here in 69, and it was probably 1974 or 5 when God literally opened that gate. He said, I'm going to do something special in your church. And he opened that gate. And real spiritual, powerful traffic happens in this place. And if you're here when that happens, and it captivates your life, you can never be satisfied with religion. You can never be satisfied with a Sunday religion that appeases your conscience and the rest of the day, week, we live to ourselves and do whatever we want. And pursue our own dreams. Doesn't mean we're out sinning and being bad, but it, this captivates our heart. Where life becomes Colossians 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. I saw the glory. Pastor Hood saw the glory. I saw the glory. I don't know what year it was. It was the early 80s. And I was praying and seeking the Lord. And I came in here, and th that wing of our auditorium wasn't there. There was a wall right there where those uh, beams are. And I walked down there. It was dark in here. And the pressure of God's presence pushed me right to the floor. I laid prostrate on the floor, on my face, with my hands on my head. And God opened the glory to my face. I couldn't, I couldn't, lift my head up, but I could see it. I was, I was in the presence of a light that was so intense, it, it just it melted right through me. And I, I was never the same for a long time. In fact, for days I had a hard time getting my voice above a whisper. When I got out of here, I didn't have enough strength to hardly push the gas pedal. I drove all the way home idling because I was so weak. God passed the mantle to Pastor Lou Allen. And what we have now is Judges chapter 2. All the people, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. Talking about getting into the promised land. They had seen, Joshua and the elders that served with him had seen all these great things that God had done. And Joshua died, and also all that generation were gathered to their fathers, and what happened? There arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works he had done for Israel. A new generation of people had to learn how to dig in 
They had to learn how to pursue their promise. God has given us exceedingly great and precious promises at this church. At this church. This is an, I, I don't even know if you know that this is an unusual place, but this is an unusual place. God has done things and is doing things here that are rocking people's worlds. So as a body of believers at New Life Assembly, we have to learn to pursue him individually. I promise you, whatever happens here on a Sunday morning between 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock in that hour space, whatever happens here is a pretty much a direct reflection of what happens in our lives out there during the week. If we're sluggish out there in our spiritual walk during the week, when we come in here, whatever happens is going to feel kind of sluggish. When a significant amount of people are learning to pursue God, if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, that you're praying morning and night saying, God, fill me with the Spirit. I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. I don't want to just be religious. I don't want to just follow the crowd. God, I want, I want to know you with power. Baptize me, please, in your Holy Spirit and seek him morning and night. And it'll happen to you. It might not happen. You might not wait to get to an altar call. But our, when we come in here having lived like that all week long, when Christ, who is my life, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, he's my life. I wake up, the first thing in my mind is whatever praise song I was listening to when I went to sleep. And I'm praising and I'm worshiping God. And, and, and he, I'm aware of his presence all day long. And I can't wait to get here. That makes life. And that's how we learn to pursue. We have a great opportunity right now to pursue. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 6 to 9 o'clock. Prayer time. Time to set aside and shut off everything else in the world. Whatever we've been doing normally, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, can't be that important. We've got to pursue. We have to learn individually to pursue. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you gotta, you got to get that engine going. you got to start speaking in tongues and praying in the Spirit. When you're driving down the road in your car, when you have spare moments, speaking to God in the Spirit. He who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Amen? Glory to God. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 